This is the Truth Frequency Radio Network. We are TFR. Truth Frequency Radio. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no bias. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again here on TruthFrequencyRadio.com, 90.7 FM in Denver, for another week of eye-gouging, crotch-kicking, no-holes-barred political and societal analysis. Glad to be back with you again in our new time slot, uh, Tuesdays, on Tuesday afternoons, glad to be back with you again, and glad to be pulling in, I'm sure, new listeners all the time as, uh, this is a time slot that's kind of an upgrade, I suppose, over where we were. So we welcome all of you new folks who are with us today on the program. And uh, stop me if you've heard this one before. A criminal is taken into custody. Something goes wrong in that exchange or in that procedure. The criminal passes away, and all of a sudden, tons of people come out of the woodwork to protest in favor of the criminal, and they end up destroying property and trying to burn down a city. Stop me if you've heard that one before. Where am I talking about? Am I talking about Ferguson? Am I talking about New York? No, this week I'm talking about Baltimore. They are the inner city in turmoil this week. I suppose next week or a couple of weeks from now, there'll be another one somewhere. Maybe maybe LA's due for a good riot. Maybe Los Angeles is due for one. They, they have about one or two a year, I guess. And I, I suppose we're all supposed to sit around and act shocked when we see these things. And wring our hands together and wipe our brow and just act as though we're so shocked and surprised this happens. But yet, the truth of the matter is every few weeks we see this somewhere. And it's getting past the point where really any of us can can act surprised. Now, ordinarily I record this show from my home studio here, but uh, this week's a little bit different because... Uh, while this show is airing on Tuesday afternoon, I'm recording this segment at least on Monday night. And as I am recording this, Baltimore does look like, as I'm speaking, it is about to go up in flames. We're just at the dusk right now, so it hadn't gotten dark out there yet. And I'm sitting here in my living room in front of a 50-inch flat screen television watching the live footage coming out of Baltimore right now. And it is appearing to be an inner city that is about to burst the seams. And I hope I'm wrong on this. And by the time you hear this, you'll know one way or the other. But I suspect that once the sun goes down here in about an hour or two from the time I'm recording this, Katie, bar the door. This is going to get ugly. So welcome to Baltimore. That's what I'm sitting here watching tonight. Go back to this weekend and... At a Baltimore Orioles game that went into extra innings, a game ended in extra innings, and uh, they couldn't let the the, the crowd leave the stadium because so much violence was going on. And then the mayor out there was saying this weekend that she was giving space to people who wanted to destroy. It's all been rather surreal. But it all hasn't been unseen before. For those of you who are new to this show, and again, I know there's a good number of you that are because we, we've gone to this Tuesday afternoon time slot in front of a far higher number of listeners, potentially, than, than we've ever had before. For those of you who are new to this show and have not heard some of our, our previous shows or any of my work on, on my America's Evil Genius program on YouTube, you may not be aware why it is that on this show, topics like this and events like this 
are so interesting to us. We probably talk about these type of subjects a little bit more on this show than I would wager other shows on Truth Frequency Radio do. There's got to be a reason for that. There's got to be a reason that we are so interested in this, if you will. Well, for those of you who may not be aware, we record this particular program just about a few miles, six, seven miles maybe, from Ferguson, Missouri. Or in the greater St. Louis area, we record this show just a short drive from the epicenter of where everything went down last fall. That means that what was interesting to you to watch on television last fall was very much a part of our daily existence. And still is, by the way. There's a lot of things that continue to go on down there that, that aren't really talked about much because you know, the national media cameras have gone somewhere else now. They're in Baltimore, so that's going to be where, where they're focused now. They're not really paying much attention out here now, but the residual effects of all of this stuff continues out here. And I thought Ferguson was one of the places where we really saw the beginning of this trend. This trend of a criminal committing a criminal act, the police responding as they thought necessary, the criminal ending up being deceased as a result, and all of a sudden, this cry of indignation from people who, no matter how you slice it, people who are standing up in favor of criminal behavior, people who are more concerned about those who protect us from the criminal than they are the actions of the criminal themselves. That's what we saw in Ferguson. It's what we saw in New York. We seem to see it every week somewhere. Tonight we're seeing it in Baltimore. Today we're seeing it in Baltimore. And it's becoming a disturbing enough trend. It's becoming a common enough thing that that you just wonder where our collective head is at in America today. Are we going to stand here and allow this? Are we going to stand here and allow criminals to come out of the woodwork under the guise of protesting other criminals? Are we going to allow them to take over our cities and later on our suburbs, because that's coming next? Are we going to allow them to take over and to not only physically assault police officers, but also also assault, in a more uh, abstract sense, assault the very pillars of American society. Assault the very foundations of what is right and wrong in America. If you bother to talk to any of these people, if you can stomach to listen to them, so many of them, if they can put together a coherent sentence, complain about how things need to be different in their communities, how things need to, dare I say it, change. We need this, we need that, we're, we're disadvantaged. Always an excuse coming from these people. Always an excuse from these criminals who protest in favor of other criminals and put police in harm's way and put citizens in harm, harm's way and put property in harm's way. Always an excuse from these people. Now, I don't think it's coincidental that these people, or at least people with these sorts of attitudes, were the very people that Barack Obama spent two election campaign cycles pandering to and claiming he would give a voice to. Well, he clearly did give a voice to those people. But as we look at Baltimore and Ferguson and New York City and whoever it will be next week, it's becoming pretty clear that these people do not deserve to have a voice, at least not at this point in American history. And before you jump out of your chair, I'm not saying that in a racial term, not at all. I'm not saying anything about blacks not having a voice. I'm saying, specifically, the people in these inner cities who are on the side of the thugs, over the side of police, they do not deserve to have a voice in America. 
They must be assimilated into society before they can have a voice. Because if they were given a voice right now, given what they are demonstrating, it would end up being nothing but a disaster. Now, forget about having the right to protest. At, at its essence, nobody disputes that people have that right. Nobody disputes that in America you have a right to peacefully protest. No, nobody complains about that. We do have the right to complain about why people are protesting. We do have a right, via our free speech, to shout down those who protest in favor of things that are destructive to society and to ostracize them and to shame them and to drown them out, we do have that right, and I would say that moral obligation, to do what we can to drown out and silence people who believe that there's justification in protesting against the police. I believe we have that. Should not society shun and ostracize those who protest against law and order, those who protest against property rights? I should think not, because if, if society does not do that, then truly we do not have, or would not have, civil society at all. Now, there's a lot of people out there. There's a lot of do-gooders and bleeding hearts and just uninformed people, some of them very young, without a life experience. And, and, and I'm going to pause here just to mention I'm, I'm watching pictures on the television tonight as I'm, as, I'm, as I'm doing this show. And I'm seeing pictures right now of, and you'll pardon my phone going off in the background. Again, we're taping this in the living room tonight because of the events going on. But um, I'm watching video of a store that a bunch of looters are going into. There's a sign on the door of the store that says no one in a hoodie is allowed. It's paraphrasing here, but if you're wearing a stocking cap or hoodie, you're not allowed in the store. I just saw about 10 or 12 people run into that store all wearing hoodies. Isn't that ironic, don't you think? It's like rain on, on your wedding day. Anyway, I just thought that was interesting, and I'm not going to say funny, but well, maybe it is funny in kind of a gallows humor sort of way. Anyhow, back to my original point. You undoubtedly will hear and have heard, will hear over the next few days, any number of bleeding hearts and do-gooders. Maybe they're liberals, maybe they're Democrats. Maybe they're just young people still in college who don't have any life experience yet, and, and so they can get taken in by, by this BS. You'll hear all kinds of people claim that, well, most protesters were nonviolent, and all this rioting and all this looting, that's just the opportunists. Oh, I know you're going to hear that. We heard it out here in the St. Louis area a few months back. Oh, God, we heard that all the time. No, 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 no. It's not upset people from Ferguson doing this stuff. It's all people coming in from somewhere else. Well, sure. There were people coming in from elsewhere that were going out there and looting and rioting and whatever. Sure, some of that happened. But it never could have happened, whether we're talking Baltimore, Ferguson, anywhere else. The violence never could have happened to begin with. If people did not create the environment where those type of attitudes were acceptable, if people did not create the environment by protesting to begin with, again, not saying people don't have the right to protest, but criticizing the judgment in protesting, criticizing the reasoning for protesting. Quite simply, while they might have the legal right to protest something like this, nobody, and I mean absolutely nobody, has the moral right to protest this. You do not have the moral right to protest the police. Period. Frankly, if you were to end up on the wrong end of a baton or some pepper spray or even artillery because you did that, I certainly wouldn't feel sorry for you and I would feel you got what you deserved. In other words, 
the very ideas that these folks are protesting in favor of, if you want to use the word protest, the very ideas that these people are protesting in favor of are violent. The idea that we should force cops to use less force or none at all in some cases on criminals, that would in turn make it easier for criminals to escape or even kill police or do harm to other law-abiding citizens. In other words, less violent police, if you want to phrase it that way, would not result in less violence in society, would not result in less violence from criminals. Instead, it would simply transfer that violence to the rest of us. The criminals would even be more emboldened than they already are, which has got to seem nearly impossible these days, but they would be far more emboldened than they already are if the hands of the police were even more tied. And we see that. We see that. Now, here in the St. Louis area, and again, some of this doesn't make national news because all the cameras went to New York and now they're in Baltimore and they'll be somewhere else the week after that. But out here in St. Louis... We've had all kinds of situations in the greater metro area since Ferguson where police are hesitant to do what needs to be done in certain situations. Oh, they always want to use that taser. And then sometimes when they use a taser, they get criticized for that. We see situations where they abandon car chases sometimes. And quite frankly, the criminals are running roughshod here. They've only been emboldened. We just, I just saw a story a couple weeks ago that the rate of resigning police officers in St. Louis County is through the roof. They're having a very difficult time replacing them. Do you think that's any coincidence? That they see what happens in Ferguson and they realize, wait a second, if I do my job, I probably will likely lose my job. If I don't do my job, I'll probably get killed in the line of duty. There's got to be a better way to make a living than this or at the very least, a better place, a better city, a better town, a better area, a better police department with which I can ply my trade, or I will be allowed to do my job without all kinds of problems breaking loose when I do so. In other words, these protests, at their essence, are violent. Even if some of the protesters are not exhibiting violent behavior themselves. They are arguing in favor and advocating in favor of violence by criminals. So there is no such thing as a non-violent protester. There is no separation between those who are protesting appropriately and those who are not, because the bottom line is it is impossible to protest in favor of this kind of thing appropriately. Because the very idea they are protesting in favor of is inappropriate in all circumstances. It's an idea that should never be taken seriously by a civilized society. The idea that somehow we are supposed to place more value on the life of a criminal than we are the life of someone who protects us from the criminals. The idea that we are to place more value in the life of a criminal and protect their life more than we protect our own lives or our own property. No, sir, that is not America. And I go back to last week's show when I talked about the presidential election next year, and I went through five key issues that I'm going to be judging every candidate on. Most of them were pretty straightforward things, amnesty, fiscal responsibility, national defense. I mean, you, you, I can say those words and immediately you have a pretty good read on what I mean by them. But one of the things I mentioned, one of the issues that I said was one of my top five important issues was a little bit more abstract, and I'm not sure everybody thoroughly understood it, but it was the idea that I want a president who will be able to take the fight to all these people out there who are protesting against the police, who are in favor of the criminals out there, who are advocating this lawlessness in society. I'll just flat out put it in an easier to understand way this week. I want a president who's going to fight the thugs. I want a president who's going to go into this, these inner cities and take the fight to these thugs and treat them the same way that we treat ISIS. 
Treat them as the same kind of enemy we treat ISIS as. I want to declare war on our inner city criminals. Michael Brown's situation has proven we must do so. This deal in Baltimore is proving we must do so. And there's many, many, many other examples. And again, some of you are hearing me use the word thug and you're going to flip out and call me a racist and everything else. I'm anything but. When I say thug, I am talking specifically about the people who adopt the urban mindset today, who adopt that culture, because at the end of the day, we choose our culture. Our culture is not an extension of our race or ethnicity. Your culture is always something you choose to belong to or choose not to belong to. So I'm talking about people who choose that urban culture and believe that the police are constantly in the wrong and who believe the police are out of line and believe police should be shot at or attacked or they shouldn't be able to fight back. I'm talking specifically about those people. And frankly, I think we need to do whatever it takes to eliminate eliminate that type of mindset from America. Now, this undoubtedly sounds like a little much to some of you. I don't doubt that. Might sound more than a little draconian to some of you. I want to give you some historical perspective. This is not the first time in America's history that we've seen this type of lawlessness and violence from criminals who are trying to destroy the pillars of our society. Far from it. Some things that were quite similar to this happened in the 1960s. And yes, I'm talking partially about the race riots of those days, places like Watts and other, other places, Chicago, many other, Newark, New Jersey, a lot of other places. Yes, I'm talking about those race riots of the 60s, but that's not all I'm talking about. I'm also talking about the anti-war movement. I'm also talking about the hippies of that era. I'm talking about all of those ne'er-do-wells of the 1960s that decided, for some reason, the great nation they grew up in that provided them with such a magnificent standard of living and, and provided them with opportunities that their parents and grandparents could only have dreamed of. This idea that such a great culture, such a great nation, needed to be radically changed. And those people brought violence to us. Those people look at the Democratic National Convention of 1968. No doubt you've seen the footage of the violence caused by those hippies and caused by those protesters at that time. Look at Kent State, where protesters and hip hippies forced the National Guard to fire upon them and protect themselves. Look at all the race riots. It goes on and on. Folks, we have been here before. We have been here before. We have been in this nation at a time when those who wish to destroy the very fabric of what we stand for got up in arms, got violent, got in the streets, got the cameras on them, got the microphones in their faces. We've lived through it once in the 1960s, and what was the result of living through it one time? 50 years of moral depravity, 50 years of a continual downward slide in America, with the possible exception of the 1980s, morally and in terms of who we are as a nation. See, those, those, those young hippies didn't grow up. Or they, they didn't go quietly away when they grew up anyway. A lot of them kept doing this crap when they were, when they were older. Some of them went into political office. A lot of them got embedded in the government. And so the crap they pushed then continues on today, and it has now resulted in what you're seeing tonight in Baltimore, in Ferguson, in New York, in Oakland, in any number of these places. It is high time in America 
that we learn our lesson from the 1960s and we focus on eliminating this thought process from society. And I'm not a big Richard Nixon fan, but one thing he understood in the 1960s was that the average American citizen, the average property owner, the average guy that goes out there and works for a living and then comes home and turns on the TV news and he sees race riots and he sees hippies protesting and whatever, he understood that that man, that man didn't like what he saw and he saw his country bursting at the seams. He thought, saw his country on fire. And that's why Richard Nixon went on a campaign of law and order, and it won him the 1968 election. I think a Republican candidate today could do the same. Because there's a lot of people I talk to, they're not vocal, but when you talk to them one-on-one, -on -one, there's a lot of people who are seeing what happens in Ferguson and Baltimore and so forth. And they weep for our nation. They see our nation changing and not in a good way. This is Obama's America we're seeing, I fear. And so I think a presidential candidate that made law and order and getting this type of behavior corralled, getting these type of people assimilated back into society, that would resonate with a lot of people. And there's, and, and there's some political folks out there that are too scared to do it. But the first one that does, and I'm telling you, is going to have a great opportunity. Folks, that's the first segment in the books. We're going to come back. Hey, what if you live in Baltimore? What if you are one of these thugs? How can you better yourself? We'll tell you. Up next here on America's Evil Genius Truth Frequency Radio.